in the days following the Six Day War, uh, there was a committee. And on that committee it was run by Moshe Dayan, who was the Minister of Defense. Uh, the heads of the committee were Cheech Shlomo Lahat, later mayor of Tel Aviv, and Gandhi, uh, later commander of the Central Command, Minister of Tourism. Um, and they were commissioned to say what Jerusalem is going to be. Because we did in East Jerusalem what we did not do anywhere else, we annexed it. And they had to determine where the border would go. Um, I have a friend who was in the, on that committee, now well into his 70s, former senior official in the Ministry of Construction, and the idea came up, why don't we extend the boundary of Jerusalem so it will include Kevet Rachel? And Moshe Dayan barked, I'm not going to annex downtown Bethlehem for some Kevet Sheikh Mushtan, translated freely is some shitty Kever Sheikh. It's an indication of the transformation that Israeli society has undergone in the years since the Six Day War. In that small area, it is clear that this is no mere terrain, it's no mere landscape. This is an arena, and it's an arena of national struggle. The last event in that arena was last Tuesday or Wednesday when uh, um, uh, we greeted the uh, resumptions of negotiations by announcing, what is it, 942 new units in Gilo immediately to the north of Kedarachim. And that's the major lesson that I have learned from my, I guess it's 21 years now, but who's counting, of, of dealing with Jerusalem. Everything that has transpired in Jerusalem since 1967 has been driven by the calculus of national struggle. And that national struggle is shaped primarily in the geography of the city. As a result of that, the planners and the architects have not been the field marshals in this struggle, national struggle, but they haven't been the foot soldiers either. They've been the Ubdunere, they've been the division commanders, they've been the brigade commanders, and they have had a pivotal role in the making and the unmaking of Israeli rule in East Jerusalem. What I would like to do with you this evening, very briefly, very telegraphically, is to tell you what I, how I view this struggle since 1967, and then open it up for questions. The struggle began the day after the war, when the decision was made, we are going to annex East Jerusalem. East Jerusalem was tiny. It was 6.5 square kilometers. It was the old city. The old city is the size of a postage stamp, one square kilometer, and the small area, Salah Adin, the downtown area, and the visual basin around the old city. That was Jordanian Jerusalem. Everything beyond that was West Bank. We decided to annex a large city. And the principles were driven, again, by the calculus, what will be good in the interests of Israel. So, number one, Mapai, this is labor, very pragmatic. Take as much land as possible with as few Palestinians as possible. So we ended up drawing a line. Sometimes it would divide a village in two. And that line incorporated into Jerusalem 70.5 square kilometers of what was the West Bank, only six and a half of which was Jordanian Jerusalem. We also incorporated 69,000 Palestinians and in was it? If you all have maps, we can show you on the map. The, the border can be seen on the blue line, more or less parallel to the red line, 70.5 square kilometers. On what basis? Number one, 
we were in the wake of the trauma of 1967, take the hills. The Jordanians bombarded West Jerusalem from the hills, take the hills. So you take Kilo, you take Ramot, um, etc. Number two, second trauma of the war. Heal the breach, the wound in the urban fabric. One of the great traumas of 1967 and between 1949 and 1967 was the isolation of Mount Scopus. So immediately you include Mount Scopus and uh, that area within Jerusalem. Finally, you can't have a national capital that respects itself without having an airport. So send a finger up to the north in the direction of Ramallah so that you will include the Kalandia Airport. In the ensuing years, the goal of Israeli policies have remained constant and have not changed even though much of the political climate has. The goal was to create facts on the ground that A, would guarantee a strong and robust Israeli majority in the city of Jerusalem. In 1967, the Israeli population was 75% of the population. The Palestinians were 25%. The declared goal, the euphemism, maintain the demographic balance of the city. Secondly, create that balance not in West Jerusalem, but throughout Jerusalem, and to create facts by large settlement neighborhoods that will make the political division of the city impossible. That is the driving engine of all planning in Jerusalem, with rare exception. How, what were the mechanisms? Since 1967, Israel expropriated 35% of the privately owned land in East Jerusalem, overwhelmingly from Palestinians. That means that for each three balatot, tiles, Israel took one. Were the Palestinians entitled to compensation? Yes. Did they take it? No. Accepting compensation would be acquiescence to the legitimacy of Israeli rule. They didn't. We got it. We didn't pay for it. On the expropriated lands, we built upwards of 53,000 residential units from for Israelis only. Until 2009, it was illegal to sell or lease property to Palestinians from East Jerusalem in the settlement neighborhoods. That was amended. It is now legal. But offering a Palestinian from East Jerusalem to buy an apartment in Gilo is like offering somebody from Shunat to take for the opportunity to buy a villa in Sabion. It sounds great. It just is fictitious. The neighborhoods were built on all available, namely empty, privately owned land. There were virtually no demolitions. Israel did not demolish homes in order to build these neighborhoods. The neighborhoods were built adjacent to, and for the most part, not within existing Palestinian neighborhoods. The goal of this was twofold. A, to assure the Jewish majority, and B, to make sure no political division of the city. It was not enough to accelerate um, the Israeli the development of the Israeli sector. It was necessary to put an artificial cap on the development of the Palestinian sector. Put bluntly, the birth of an Israeli child in Jerusalem is a simcha. The birth of a Palestinian child in Jerusalem is a demographic problem. And the goal was to thwart the development of the Palestinian sector. And this is a field in which the architects figured prominently. By the way, the architects figured prominently in the building of 53,000 homes as well. And our friends were all engaged in this. 
I know of nobody of my age, architect, who did not participate, including people who are terribly politically correct. Let me tell you one story that I think will illuminate um, how the planning regime worked and in many ways continues to work vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian population. In the early 1990s, we began, uh, we Israel, began the project of Har Choma, and we expropriated Har Choma. It was in the beginning of the Oslo process, there was a firestorm, great deal of controversy, and I took the case as an attorney, representing Palestinians from Umtuba and from Beit Sakhor in the West Bank to the High Court of Justice. My claim was very simple. Number one, you're always expropriating from Palestinians. You're always building for the Jews. That's not Hanababli. That's not a violation of etiquette. That is illegal discrimination. The second claim was, is look, you've got this empty forested hill and you're building high rises and you're building dense housing, look across the wadi at Um Tuba. They're allowed at most one or two stories. They're not allowed to build anything. The court case went on for years, and under the pressure of the court case, the municipality decided they were going to plan Um Tuba and Surbach for the Palestinian neighborhoods, a new town plan. I looked at the plan, it was horrible. It was just horrible. They, they basically, they were not allowing the Palestinians to build anything that wasn't there. And I started to write about it. Well, I get a phone call from a fairly prominent town planner in Jerusalem. Old son of Teddy, sort of like out of the Gashash routine. But a very good um, professional town planner, and he said, Danny, you don't know what they've done to me. They hired me. I won the mikras. I won the bid to plan the Palestinian neighborhood of Surbach. And they said to me, you can plan it any way you like, as long as you obey three parameters. A, the blue line is fixed. The borders of the plan. Two, this is your programma. This is your um, program for public institutions. Fine. How many schools? How many um, clinics? Things of that nature. And three, this is the maximum number of residential units you're allowed to include in the plan. And he said, that's great. Uh, get to work. So I go out to the field, this fellow tells me, and I start counting homes. And it turned on the day that my work was commissioned and I was told that you are allowed 1,400 residential units, there were already 1,700 residential units in Sumbach. I could not plan one additional unit. At best, I could legalize some of the illegal units. This was all done under the mantra of maintaining the demographic balance of the city. I'm not here to preach. I'm not here to criticize. We can talk judgmentally perhaps later. Just let me give you a couple of the statistics. You know, you hear on occasion about home demolitions in East Jerusalem. Very controversial, especially when Mayor Barkat decides to do it at the very hour that he's meeting with Hillary Clinton. The Clintons don't like things like that. Well, what are the statistics? Okay. In 1967, there were 69,000 Palestinians in East Jerusalem. There were 12,600 homes. Today, there are upwards of 45,000 homes. We've gone from 12,600 to above 45,000. We really don't know the real number because nobody counts in Machane Pichim in the refugee camp. And there are 293,000 residents. That's a huge increase. How many building permits did Israel give, did the Jerusalem municipality give between 1967 and today? About 4,100 less than, legitimizing less than 10,000 homes. The meaning of this is 
well over 50% of the homes in East Jerusalem today in the Palestinian sector have been built without permits. Part of this is their fighting back and saying, you don't let us build it, we're going to build illegally. There is an element of their national struggle. But part of it is desperation because it is not uncommon to find people who are not destitute, who have children sleeping two and three in a bed because they are not allowed to build. Be pastoral and shut up. Uh, there have been attempts, recent attempts, by Mayor Barkat, and I'm not one of his great supporters, to plan some of the outlying areas for Palestinian construction, the planning department in the Jerusalem municipality backs the plan, their mayor backs the plan, and he can't bring it before the municipal committee because he doesn't have a majority, because visceral hatred reigns within the right wing and religious parties. And even with the mayor's blessing, Tipus al Kirot, it's climbing slippery walls. Let's ask just another couple of questions, and then we can begin to sum up. Has the Israeli policy succeeded? And the answer is yes and no. Today, there are 193,000, 195,000 Israelis living in East Jerusalem. There were one in 1967. That is a massive demographic change. So you have two national collectives, not only in Jerusalem, you have two national collectives in East Jerusalem. 195,000 Israelis, 293,000 Palestinians. It is clear that many of these changes are irrevocable. Um, I think that no one, except those who fantasize about the utopian one-state solution or the destruction of the state of Israel, nobody anticipates the dismantlement of Gilo or Ramot, each of which are the sizes of small cities. And the Palestinians have accommodated themselves that regardless of the political future of Jerusalem, these will become part of Israel in the framework of a land swap. In that sense, the Israeli policies have clearly succeeded. But in many other ways, it's been an abject failure. Number one. Uh, Israel has lost the war of the womb. The Palestinian population is not 25% of the population as it was in 1967. It is 37 or 38% of the population. There are more Palestinian children born yearly in Jerusalem than there are Jewish children. I, as an Israeli patriot, still find reason to celebrate Israeli independence day in what I consider to be my national capital. The rest of the world doesn't necessarily agree with me. I belong to a minority. 37, 38% of the population see our independence as their Nakba, national tragedy. And you may have heard rumor to the effect that the Haredim have certain outstanding issues with the Zionist movement. They don't celebrate independence day. We live in a virtual capital. Jerusalem is emphatically a binational city. The Palestinians, country, in spite of all of our massive construction, they are not Israeli. They've never seen themselves as Israeli. We've never treated them that way in ways that are very different from the Palestin Israeli Palestinian citizens of Israel in the Negev or in the Galilee. Entirely different. Jerusalem remains a divided city. There are glass walls all over the city. Israelis do not venture into 95% of East Jerusalem. They've never been there. They never will be there. They don't even know the places exist. 5%, yes. Old city, historic basis. My friends from Tel Aviv will go on what I call is a Jewish safari. They want to do something dangerous with a whiff of danger. They will go two blocks over from route number one into the courtyard of the American Colony Hotel, have a gin and tonic, and feel really, really special. That is your divided city. And when their tensions are high, it is as if there is a Berlin Wall running down route number one. Tensions go down. Yes, you have mingling. Where do you find mingling? 
hospitals, emergency rooms, the biblical zoo, McDonald's, and when tensions are really low, they can load them all. We live in separate places. We live in different life space. We go to different schools. Israel cannot deliver a letter in East Jerusalem because we cannot give credible street names to the streets and numbers to the houses. Our, our vet once suggested, since we have an alpha beagle of Moroccan descent with an attitude problem, that we put the GPS chip in the dog's ear. It's 10 o'clock, do you know where your beagle is? I think in Orwellian terms, what would happen if you were to put a GPS chip in the ear of every Israeli and every Palestinian so you could separate between the two? You would see 95% of the border in Jerusalem. The Palestinian neighbors are already Palestinian. Watch the feet. Only Palestinians live there and work there. The Israeli neighbors, including settlement neighbors in East Jerusalem, not the ones in Silwan and Russell, the large ones, Israel, the border already exists. Fast forward, two last things. One big thing has changed. We haven't absorbed it yet, but it's changed. And that is, today, it is an international commonplace becoming more outspoken that the only way of ending this conflict is the two-state solution, and the only way of implementing the two-state solution is inside the city of Jerusalem. It is a total national consensus, with the exception of the Canadian Foreign Ministry and okay. Pastor Hagee. Can you repeat that? I didn't get the last sentence. There is an international consensus, wall to wall, with rare exception. The Canadian Foreign Minister is an exception. <laughs> Pastor Hagee, the evangelical movement, is an exception. That the only way that this conflict will end is in a political division of the city of Jerusalem. As a result of that, actions that were acceptable or forgivable uh, with no political horizon, expropriation, settlement, have been driving Israel into increasing isolation. August is an interesting month for me every year because once a year, the diplomats change. And in comes a new crew of bright-eyed, bushy-tailed young men and women, United States, Great Britain, and I have to teach them what's Jerusalem about. Do you know what most, do you know what most of our learning is? The planning laws. Do you know that they know that certain, in the White House, they know that certain plans require the signature of the Minister of Interior, that they know that reparcelization schemes are in the authority of the Jerusalem municipality? Do you know that every single plan in East Jerusalem is flagged by them? They have advanced warning systems. This is viewed by them not only as a cardinal political issue, I have had discussions in the last two weeks with three star generals from the Pentagon on the intricacies of the Israeli planning law. Because getting this conflict under control and ultimately beginning to address the core grievances was messed up by the planners it will also be solved by the planners. This is a new version of you broke it, you buy it. The planners were not the overall architects of the mess we're in, but they were, and we were, including myself, willing participants. Today, I believe the roles of the planners are changing, and that is number one, a growing sensitivity that planning is an inflammatory and damaging step, step when it takes place in the context of a, an untrammeled national struggle, and two, it is about 
we are again asking, this last month, for the first time in years, what can the planners do to address the core grievances between Israelis and Palestinians under the assumption that we are heading to a political agreement? Now, the politicians don't always ask the planners. The politicians carry out microsurgery by taking out a hatchet and slamming it, slamming it down. But the real question that is already being asked in this new round of negotiations, and I am not speaking theoretically, the real question that is being asked, given the history of the last four and a half decades in Jerusalem, given the deck that we now have, demographically, geographically, the location of Israeli settlement neighborhoods, the location of a Palestinian collective within a 20 kilometer radius of the Temple Mount Haram al Sharif, there are 780,000 Palestinians, 680,000 Israelis, and neither side is giving an indication that they're willing to evaporate, even though that's exactly what the other side would want to happen. And the question that is now being asked, how is it possible to carve out a viable Palestinian city in Jerusalem that will be contiguous with the state of Palestine, integrated into a Palestinian metropolis in ways that will allow for a robust Israeli city, including the large settlement neighborhoods and the settlement blocks around the city in the way that these two metropolises can cohabit. Is that possible? That is the question that is already being asked by planners who are engaged in the negotiating process. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, and you can ask in English or Hebrew, and if you'd like, I can translate that into. Okay. Um, the question is, is it possible to arrive at a territorial division um, without dividing Jerusalem? Physically. At least politically. Physically. I, I, I'll give you the answer politically. They're both. Okay. I would be very glad. If you come to me and say, you don't believe an agreement between Israelis and Palestinians is possible. I will disagree with you vehemently. I think it is possible. It's going to be very typical, but it's possible. Um, but I think that if you say it's not possible, you can make a very, very compelling argument. I mean, there's a very good argument to say this is an insoluble conflict. If, on the other hand, you come to me and say, you know, an agreement is possible, but we will maintain the mantra. What's the mantra? Jerusalem, the other by the capital of Israel, that we'll never agree with you about it, which is one word. And, and now you have to be able to recite it seven times in a row in order to get elected to Congress. Okay? Jerusalem will remain complete and there will be an agreement. Now, I have no interest in embarrassing you. I will quietly take you aside and ask you, have you been smoking something? Because obviously you and I are not living in the same universe. This conflict may never end. If it ends, it ends inside Jerusalem. It ends with every Palestinian neighborhood no longer being under Israeli sovereignty. In Yerz Hashem, it ends with none of the large settlement neighborhoods having to be affected by that. That's still possible today. Um, so my answer is, the conflict may never end. If it does, I can show you where it does. Okay? Your question, which you sort of tacked on, which is a great one. Does this have to be a physical boundary? Okay? Um, I could sell you a bill of good and say, no, we're just talking politically. This is all going to be kumbaya, we're going to get along and we're going to walk off into the sunset. I've been out in the streets of Jerusalem, almost East Jerusalem, almost every day for the last 21 years. And my lesson is as follows. If there will be a permanent status agreement, please know, and I learned this from Dad, not a peace agreement, permanent status. 
piece reminds me of Isaiah, lion's lambs. <clears throat> the Palestinians would love to drive us into the sea. My friends, we would like to drive them across the Jordan River into the desert to die. Neither of those options is immediately available. The two-state solution is the next best approximation. It is the way we get rid of each other. It's not a terribly romantic vision, but I believe that will be the driving engine of any political agreement, both on the Israeli side and on the Palestinian side. Shlomo Gazit, who was the first military governor in the West Bank, and um, later to become head of Israeli intelligence, once told me, you know, I never liked Oslo because I was never sure if Oslo was a marriage or a divorce. Well, I'm telling you now, the agreement between Israelis and Palestinians will be a divorce. And there will be a hard, impermeable border in Jerusalem, at least in the beginning. It need not be a wall, but it, it's, there are, I will need to present a passport in order to visit my friends in Sheikh Jarrah or in the Shuafat refugee camp. Having said that, this, these are small stuff that you learn from. There's hardly a week that goes by that I don't get a phone call. You don't know me, I'm a settler, but I've got this Palestinian friend, can you help me? There are all sorts of hidden veins and arteries under the surface that are still worn out. They can't thrive because of occupation and the Israeli war, or whatever you want to call it. The day the border goes up, is the day the border begins to unravel. Twen 10 years, 20 years after an agreement, that border will begin to open up and breathe. It will be decided more by life than by politicians and yojis, and they're not always the same thing, okay? Uh, but there is no way of getting to there without the divorce. The reconciliation begins the day after the divorce. East Jerusalem is going to take a generation to heal after the border is put there. But it won't begin to heal until it is. You know, you, you know it's perceived that I, 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 I stand here and, you know, and pillory criticize Israeli policies and what the architects did and what the... Had I been a bit older and made Aliyah in 1968, and instead of 1973, I would have been working with Teddy Kohler building those neighborhoods. Don't judge people based on 213 standards, the way they saw things in, in 1967 and 1968. But you can't continue to act today as if we're in 1968. Israelis rule East Jerusalem unwisely, unjustly, unfairly, not because we're dumb and not because Zionism is racist. We have no business ruling them in the first place. We don't want them. They don't want us. It's all based on a thinly veiled fiction. Israelis can't plan for East Jerusalem. We have the talent, we have the sensitivity, but planning that is not rooted in the soil of the community isn't good planning. And planning that's rooted in the soil of the community can't happen under occupation. The only way that East and West Jerusalem begin to heal is by the creation of the world. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, usually talking about borders uh, in public discussion, uh, people refer to two different dimensions, historical one and physical one. In the, your presentation, you referred to more to the physical one. You mentioned that the border is already existing. So from your point of view, these two dimensions should be integrated in order to define the border as a line, or we should neglect the historical issues okay. as not... It's, oh. a, it's a great question. And in which proportion? It's, it's a great, great question, and it's another lecture, but let me, and I'm not going to evade it. When I go out and around, and I do it fairly often, I will go down route number one and say, look, there's a border here. This is ours, this is theirs. It's con you're constantly using the geographical scalpel, okay? And then you get 
to Mount Scopus, then you get to the Mount of Olives, and then you overlook the old city, and you look down at Gethsemane, and you look down at the ancient Jewish cemetery, and you look at Taran al-Sharif, which is the Temple Mount, the city of David, which is still one, and you know, hey, this is not real estate. This can't be remaxed, okay? Uh, and, and no scalpel is going to do here, because these areas, you know, 95% of the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians is territorial. But the 5%, it's a battle of narrative, a battle of symbol. And when you look, look at the, 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 just the old city, one square kilometer. In suburban America, most malls have more floor space than you have in the old city. Okay? And in this one square kilometer, you have three mutually incompatible religious narratives. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, two mutually incompatible national narratives, cohabiting the same space. It's like having a newly divorced couple sharing the same one-room apartment for the rest of their life after their divorce and never leaving. That means that in and around the old city, it will be necessary to deviate from the primitive principles of territorial sovereignty. I believe that territorial sovereignty will be di divided even there. But there will be special arrangements guaranteeing that there will no, be no crimes against the skyline or against the character of the old city, perhaps internationally enforceable. Guarantees, I believe, international. Even if the sovereignty that is divided, that will protect the access to and integrity of religious and historical sites. An agreement, any agreement that fails to address the fears or and the views of faith communities in Israel, Palestine, but also in rural France and in Jakarta or Brooklyn is going to be a bad agreement. And by the way, this is something that the architects are also involved in. Much of the monumental architecture going on today in and around the old city is there to make a statement. This is ours. This is biblical Jerusalem. The rest of you, and in this Bible, there's one testament, and the rest of you have got to get used to it. There are other ways of expressing the multiple voices of Jerusalem. Any agreement that does not provide mechanisms, sober mechanisms, that no community feels it's needing to struggle to maintain its identity is not going to be a good agreement. So you're entirely correct. The area in and around the old city of Jerusalem, which does resonate with history, requires somewhat of a different methodology. I was speaking in code. Let me give you one small example of what I was talking about, this weird here thing. Oh, Mount of Olives. We, we, we know that Mount of Olives is not real estate. You, know, you stand at the Seven Arches Hotel, look down, I think the estimates are between 150,000 and 200,000 people buried in the Jewish cemetery going back 2,500 years. And you look further down the hill and you can see the cypress and olive groves of Gethsemane and then across to a Rachma cemetery on the other side and the esplanade of the Dome of the Rock. You know, it's so clear that Mount of Olives is of symbolic, iconic value for traditional Jews, the site of the resurrection when the Messiah comes. For Christians, Jesus entered Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, spent his last night before the arrest at Gethsemane, and after the resurrection, ascended to the heaven from the Church of the Ascension, steeped in sacred history. And there's a Muslim tradition that in the end of days, there will be a bridge, the width of a hair, that will extend from the Mount of Olives to Haram al-Sharif. The wicked will fall into purgatory, and the righteous will make it to Haram al-Sharif and ascend to heaven. What does the Mount of Olives need most to round out its symbolic, unique character? The idea of colleges. 
The idea of what? The idea of Chalukah, um, I'm not making this up. It, the, the plan, to, the idea of college is to take them from Tlilot here and to move them to the Mount of Olives was on the agenda a week before the Obama visit. And its approval was a foregone conclusion. And I called the Prime Minister's office and said, are you sure that this is the welcoming gift that you want to give President Obama? Didn't what happened with Biden when he was here, wasn't that? And they took it off the agenda. And it's been taken off three or four times since then. But it's still there. It's a serious plan. Uh, it has been deposited for public review. The next stage are hearings. The world churches are up in arms. They're quiet about it because they're vulnerable, but they're saying, we're not anti-idea. Can't you put it up the road? Don't you understand that we perceive this as a violation of things that are dear to us? By the way, the, there is huge opposition within the idea to this plan. Why? Because they've received phone calls from Mullen, the previous chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and all of the military attaches in Tel Aviv, saying, no, guys, we send officers to your war colleges, to your defense courses. Not one of our officers is going to step foot in that building if you put it there. This is a colossal act of self-ostracism. Where is it coming from? Prime Minister's office. Jerusalem has, and this is a quote, a biblical past, a biblical present, a biblical future. It is a Jewish city. We will treat our minorities well. The Christians, the Muslims, the Palestinians, as a function of our generosity and tolerance, and as testimony to civilization's past. Tolerated minorities. Your rights. The cloister will not be violated. We will not go be inside of your holy sites. But the public domain, it's going to be a renewed biblical kingdom. Now, the history of Jerusalem is littered with leaders for thousands of years who have purported to possess this city in the name of some higher order, a god or a people or whatever. Jerusalem is a viable city when it speaks in its multiple voices. And that means that Palestinians have to plan for themselves. And the Franciscans, who are the biggest landowners in the city after Israel, have to plan for themselves. And it means that the Palestinians and the Muslims have to plan for themselves. And if you look at the Dome of the Rock, you can understand that there are certain talents within the Muslim world that's for that. Yeah. I can't because I don't have a computer, but okay. Right. Um, all right. So uh, I I trace my involvement in Jerusalem to a certain day and a certain time. And that was October 9th, 1991, when the settlers moved into Jerusalem to Silwan for the first time. Silwan is Axis Mundi. It is the microcosm of the entire conflict. Silwan, by the way, is a large area of 30,000 Palestinians. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about 120 duna, 30 acres. And in those 30 acres, Yesh Mashu? Okay. Uh, in those 30 acres, um, hold on a second. I'm doing that. Sure. See if something comes up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Yeah, 
Silwan is the area immediately to the south of the ramparts of the old city. Silwan is biblical Jerusalem as much and sometimes more than the old city itself. To the extent that David was an historical figure, I don't want to get into that, but from at least the 8th century, that is where Jerusalem developed. Under Silwan are the foundations of Hebraic Jewish civilization. For me, an Israeli and a Jew, it's our Stonehenge, Plymouth Rock, Mayflower, whatever. It is also a contemporary Palestinian neighborhood. Uh, and since the mid-1980s, this Palestinian neighborhood has been targeted. The goal of the settlers, and this I'm quoting them, is to transform an existing Palestinian neighborhood into an extension of the Jewish quarter of the old city. This is not a mundane settlement. This is a pseudo-biblical settlement, a bit like the evangelical theme parks in Alabama and Georgia. Um, it is not only house-to-house -house combat, which has taken place. There was a covert and largely illegal effort to take privately owned Palestinian houses and to turn them over to certain organizations. That is part of it. Today, it is my estimate in these 120 dunam, you have about 3,000 Palestinian residents and about 400 settlers. The settlers are the sheriff. The settlers run them. Um, of the active archaeological excavations in and around the old city, which are the sexiest archaeological sites on the planet, virtually all of them are under the direct or indirect control of settler organizations and funded by them. When you go to the national park, and there's no need to ask whose nation, um, and you pay an entrance fee, you will say, Rishut Teva Gavaganim, the Israel National Parks Authority and the Allied Settler Organization. The receipt you will receive is from the settler organization. Uh, there is a scheme at the bottom of the hill, the little tan spot over here, that's the Bustan, where the plan is to demolish tens of Palestinian houses in order to make open space for this site. Uh, at the top of the hill here, the next big thing coming is a massive new structure in the Givati parking lot. Um, I would describe it as this way. Many of the governmental authorities, and I have seen some of the settlers literally giving orders of how to deploy it. Border patrol troops there. Um, the, the, many of the governmental authorities have been outsourced to the settler organizations. And many of, uh, and much of the DNA this pseudo-biblical, semi-messianic DNA has been injected into the decision-making uh, authorities, from the land authority, the antiquities authority, to the, you know, uh, you know who is the director of the, is uh, the Jerusalem district of the National Parks Authority? The guy who ran the Settler Center two years ago, uh, three, no, five years ago, and he's now doing the same thing except in government. Who is the uh, current director general of Naftali Bennett's Office of Jerusalem Affairs? A guy by the name of Vir Kahana, one of the key settler activists. What you're seeing is in one small area, tiny, you have the territorial component, the biblical component, the symbolic component the demolitions, the house-to-house -house combat, it is all there. People often ask me, is the third intifada going to break out? I tend to doubt it, but it's already broken out and so on. On a nightly basis, Molotov cocktails, arrests, any political activity in Silwan that is more radical than a Cub Scout troop, you're hauled off into jail. Um, you know, I, I think that Israel has a flawed, but feisty, thing. we're probably more flawed than we were a few years ago, but we're not doing bad. 
when you hit someone, Israeli, the flawed democracy of Israel morphs into a regime. Park the Israeli Bill of Rights at the entrance to Salon. Anyway, the toy. Um, this has just come out a day or two ago. Um, the folks from SIA helped produce it. It is an iPad app, um, which is downloadable only for iPad because it's clear that only Apple is worthy of our efforts because Apple is the pinnacle of civilization. Actually, we can't afford an Android or a, but this, there will be web-based applications for this in the near future. And there are just a few things that you can do here. Number one, you can go on a virtual tour with me by not starting out on number one, and this will come up, and you know, all sorts of things. OK. Uh, T. Jerusalem, I think. Terrestrial Jerusalem. Uh, what is it? T. Jerusalem. OK. So that you, then you've got that. OK. The, 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 um, the Wi-Fi is not great here. Then you have uh, the Electronic Atlas. And this is a great working group. You want to know where Israelis live in Jerusalem or where the settlement neighborhoods are. All you have to do is take the settlement neighborhoods, and there you go. Second, there are the settlement neighbors. These are where they are throughout the end. You get an idea. Various things. You can see the root of the barrier, the old city, settlements, historical Jerusalem. You want to know where the border was during Byzantine times. You can play with that. Next thing is we have a library with articles that we've published on both crisis management. It's basically geopolitical Jerusalem having to do with uh, Israeli policies potential policy proposals and things of that nature. Our generic map here, which you can see here okay, on, online. And then, if you don't follow Jerusalem on an hourly basis, you don't know the city. So we have a Twitter feed, uh, and which is updated several times a day. And the people in the Pentagon who want to know where the next ticking time bomb is, they follow this stuff. So it's downloadable, downloadable free at the iTunes store. Oh, gosh. In the past, I thought that I was turning into a televangelist. Now I think I'm doing infomercials. <laughs> All right. Yes. You mentioned the Third Intifada, and uh, I wonder if there any kind of uh, popular resistance from the now exists from the Palestinian side that, like, I don't know, uh, pushing the issue of the borders, in particular to the area or to the government. There's very little. Uh, the one major exception, and these people are enormously courageous, are the um, Wadi Khilwe, um Information Center a real, genuine grassroots organization combating, standing up to the most powerful forces in Israel who are not playing nice. Uh, these are the people on the hill in Silwan. Um, their leaders are brought into interrogation uh, constantly, often on trumped up charges. They're getting support from all sorts of moderate politicians. It's not doing them any good. It is a genuine, nonviolent resistance movement, which is one of the reasons why it's being crushed. Palestinian society in East Jerusalem is atomized. It's always been atomized for various reasons, the political culture of the Palestinians. But we have helped atomize it. Uh, the last time there was leadership within the Palestinians of East Jerusalem was with Faisal Husseini, who died in May of 2001. He was not replaced. Israel systematically, since the outbreak of the Second Intifada, systematically crushes any genuine political activity. That was not the case in the 90s. It is today. So part of this has to do with the fact that the Palestinians are in, have a an atomized political culture in Ramallah and Gaza. Uh, Israel did not invent the atomization of the Palestinian sector. We just gave them a lot of help. Okay, thank you very much.